Hello, and welcome to the Consumer VC. I am your host, Mike Gallup, and on this show, we talk about the world of venture capital and consumer-facing startups. If you're enjoying the show, if you could please leave a review on the Apple Podcast app as it helps other folks find the show, that would be really helpful. Our guest today is Laura Chow, principal at Canaan Venture Partners. Canaan is an early-stage venture capital firm that invests in visionaries with transformative ideas. Some of her current investments include Coterie, Curtsy, and Jump Cut. At Canaan, she focuses on consumer technology. She previously worked in Deloitte's strategy and operations practice. She's also worked in sales and marketing functions within Kabam, Brand Metrics, and Greenhouse, as well as working closely with Marie Kondo to launch the author's product business. It was phenomenal talking with Laura. So without further ado, here she is. Laura, thank you so much for joining me, especially on a Friday afternoon. How are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm happy to be with you. Let's start at the beginning. What attracted you to work in startups and technology? Yeah, it's funny. Growing up, I had no idea what a startup was or what entrepreneurship was or um, this whole idea of the tech ecosystem or tech world. I grew up in Florida and I went to Stanford for undergrad and I was suddenly surrounded by this amazing energy around innovation and entrepreneurship. And it was while I was in college where I kind of got the bug. I was the president of an entrepreneurship society on campus. And then I interned at a couple of companies while I was in school, one of which was a company called Kabam, which at the time was called Water Cooler. And I was with them kind of during their first pivot of two pivots. And I I just had such an incredible experience. I got to see a company that was, you know, 15 people. And over time, eventually that company ended up selling for close to $800 million down the road. And, you know, I learned from others with their boots on the ground, just hustling and kind of making decisions all the time and iterating on the product. And it was something that I felt like I wanted to be a part of. What were some of the learnings um, in that experience as an operator? One of the big learnings that it's not just limited to Kabam, but I saw it across all the startups I've worked at, including Greenhouse or Branch Metrics and Um, certainly with Marie Kondo's company. The thing that always stood out was that there's no right answer to things and you really have to be comfortable with ambiguity. And as someone who grew up kind of heavy math uh, engineer at Stanford, I wanted things to be right, right? I wanted there to be an answer. I wanted there to be a proof. And in early stage startups, you really have to take much more of a scientific approach. You do a bunch of research, you form a hypothesis, you build a test, you see what happens, and then you do it again. And it's hard to know if, you know, the thing that you found is the best answer or the right answer, but it might be good enough. And being comfortable with good enough and then moving on was an important lesson to learn early on. How has being an operator influenced you as an investor? And do you think that maybe one of the requirements to be in venture capital and an investor should be having operational experience? You know, I think there are mixed or different schools of thought on that. And those who have been operators oftentimes say that you have to be an operator. Those who weren't say you don't. And, you know, I've had some stints as an operator, but not nearly to the extent of other founders or entrepreneurs who really built companies from the ground up. I think it's certainly a nice to have. And I think it gives you a lot of empathy for the experience of building a company, which I think, you know, so much of it at the early stage is just having the grit and the determination to keep going and being able to understand that with your portfolio companies is, is certainly a benefit. But I, I also think that you can still develop many of the skills that you might have as an operator in a VC seat, right? You can still make the right connections. You can still understand how to think about marketing or, or think about building out a sales organization. You don't have to be the expert and kind of going back to the, you know, make sure it's good enough, but not perfect. You can bring the resources around you, even if you weren't an operator, to still be a good board member or advisor or resource to your portfolio companies. In the early stages, when there isn't much data, what are some qualities that you look for in founders? And if if you wouldn't mind just walking me through your own due diligence process. Yeah. Uh, When it comes to founders, there's a couple things. One, I really gravitate towards founders who have a unique perspective or expertise in the sector that they're going after, right? If they have some sort of advantage that they're going to be able to 
um, to leverage within that industry or within that um, sector, I think that's a huge opportunity. Second, I want them to be maniacal about what they're doing. I, you know, you see a founder who can't sleep, they can't stop until they fix the thing or solve the thing. And while it, it kind of walks the line, oftentimes those founders have been ones that I've been incredibly impressed with. And then I think that the third thing, which is sometimes undervalued, but is probably one of the most important things to me, is a founder who, or founders who can really set the vision for their team and motivate them and kind of create a culture around what they're doing. A good example, one of my founders, I, I was catching up with him this week and he was telling me that before the year end, he talked to every one of his employees individually and kind of got their feedback on how things had gone over the last six months, where they were at and um, kind of get their feedback. And he took that and drafted a really concise mission statement and talked about their priorities and then presented that to the team. And even the small things, right? Like he has a book club where he buys everyone the same book each month and then they'll go to dinner and talk about it just as a way to kind of bring their heads up outside of you know, the exact thing they're working on in their role, but bring people together around the table and share perspectives and um, build culture in a different way. These early stage teams are in the trenches, as I mentioned before, and a huge part of being a CEO or founder is motivating and leading your team. Oftentimes, you know, your team might feel like they're underpaid, they might feel like they're working all the time, and it's because you have this big vision of what it is that you're building or what this could become, and being able to set that at the outset and build kind of this culture around it and motivate your team is so critical. I completely agree. Why do you focus on a consumer and what's what's different between cons, uh, investing in consumer companies and why is it challenging compared to enterprise? Yeah, you know, I used to invest in both and I think both have their challenges and their virtues. And with consumer, I think first and foremost, it, it's something that is for me, a category that's fun and exciting to experience, right? We all are consumers. And so we get to directly benefit from the types of companies that we're investing in. And everyone essentially is a consumer. And so the opportunity for the companies we back to directly impact the majority of people in the country or in the world is huge versus, you know, maybe an enterprise solution that's only meant for one type of role within a business unit. Um, again, can be massive companies, but maybe less applicable to the masses. So I think the scale of consumer companies is really exciting. And you know, I think one of the big differences is they can be harder to diligence because consumers are finicky versus being able to go to um, a CIO or um, you know, the head of a business unit or whoever it is that's going to buy it on the enterprise side. In consumer, you end up having a much higher loss ratio with your deals, but you do have more asymmetric outcomes. Again, going back to the fact that um, you're serving a much broader population. And you know, I, while that feels riskier, I, I think it is pretty exciting. And again, that opportunity to have you know, a Facebook or a Snapchat you know, really changes the, the scale at which you're playing. Yeah, absolutely. I love that you said, uh, talked about how maybe one of the challenges is that consumers are fickle. It makes it very exciting, I'd imagine, but also pretty nerve wracking. Flipping gears a little bit, what are some, you know, advice for founders that might live in secondary or tertiary markets? Do you invest in those areas? Uh, we absolutely invest in those areas. We have companies in Austin, Cincinnati, Chattanooga, Portland, but I wish we had more. Um, the the truth of the matter is that you know majority of investments are still happening on the coasts kind of in san francisco new york la um but my advice to founders um is twofold one to build communities in the areas that they are as well as outside and so having entrepreneurs as well as vcs who are outside of your market that you can kind of build a relationship with early on and who can understand your company and follow you from the beginning is really important. I think it's often hard for founders from, you know, non-coastal areas or secondary tertiary markets who come and pitch, but they've never really had an interaction with that VC before. And if that VC hasn't 
heard about them or know someone in, in common, unfortunately, sometimes it's a little bit harder to get over that initial hump or some of that initial bias. So as much as they can build that community and either get the warm intro or kind of just establish a little bit more of a, a reputation around themselves from the outset, I think it, it can be a, a big advantage. I, I think that's excellent advice and I especially love what you said about uh, the pitch how much of a difference it it is with a prepared pitch and and obviously uh, getting uh, that critique and feedback. One of the other guests on the show, Tim Cott from TAC Ventures said that try to join an accelerator uh, because you do get that experience with the pitch. And, and that gets to the community point I was trying to make, and I think you made it better, is that if you can tap into these existing communities like an accelerator or like an incubator, they can do a lot of the marketing for you, right? They'll be able to make the introductions to VCs who are outside of your market. Um, they'll be able to say, you know, hey, Kanan, you're not as active in you name your market, but we've brought together 20 incredible companies. And then it makes it much easier for me to make that trip or for me to, to become familiar with those companies rather than, you know, one in a huge pile of companies where I might not have that direct interaction. Right, right. Absolutely. So I read your chapter, which I really enjoyed in Finding Genius. So you talk about social media and how they're, and you're thinking behind social media and the, and, and the five pillars. Uh, would you mind giving me just like a little recap of the chapter just for our viewers? We'll also, um, we'll also include it in the, in the show notes as well. Perfect. Um, yeah, absolutely. So in the chapter, I talk about what I think is the future of social media. And at this point today, when I think about the social market, I think that it's fundamentally broken. You, the incumbent players like Facebook, Instagram, um, they're 10 to 15 years old and they aren't really social anymore. Um, in the chapter, I talk about how I think they're actually more aptly named status media companies because it's no longer about um, having fun and just sharing something random uh, on your status bar, but it's about broadcasting or it's about news or it's about advertising. And I think that leaves an opportunity for new, um, truly social applications to pop up. And within that, as you kind of break down what makes something social, I think that there are five pillars. Uh, the first is conversation and community. The second is utility, then entertainment, privacy and control and status. And I think all apps have varying degrees of those elements, you know, for utility, WhatsApp is a great example, entertainment, TikTok is a great example, but those degrees of each of those five pillars also changes over time. So an example would be Twitter, when it first launched was much more about conversation and entertainment. And now I would say it's arguably much more about utility where you're getting your news there or about status where you know, you're trying to amass followers and you're trying to say something really pithy that will get a bunch of retweets on, online. But ultimately, you know, it's my belief that social platforms inevitably become about status, which is kind of what I alluded to here with Twitter, which again means that there will be opportunities for new players that are social and filling that gap that I think all of us are, are looking for some sort of authentic interaction or authentic experience that does feel social. For the social media networks where the main objective or have matured to status seeking, uh, do you think that status might in turn become a negative same side network effect since folks that might not be as popular on the channel might then move to a new channel to seek that status? I think it's not quite, but I think it has some elements of it. What I think exists is that everyone is for the most part, status seeking. And I think there will always be a need for some of these platforms like what Instagram is today to continue to exist. Um, Eugene Way has a great uh, piece about it where he talks about us all being kind of status seeking monkeys. Um, and I think that's true. And so I think that there will continue to be a need for something like Instagram. Um, I think Gen Z kind of switching to TikTok or kind of having this explosion there is for two reasons, likely. One is because it does feel social and novel and it's filling that entertainment pillar that I talked about, mm -hmm. which 
don't really get anymore on Instagram where it's much more about the status and it is much more about um, sort of the advertising or the influencers. But I do think that TikTok could eventually switch over more towards that status stage. And, and that's one of the things I talk about in the chapter where I see it as this cycle where an app might start off as being truly social or you know, really heavily indexed on entertainment and novelty. But over time, whether it's the feature set that starts to pop up that's demanded by the, the user base or the user base and their behaviors that start to change, I think you do start to tip, uh, to tip into that kind of status media platform. And with TikTok, the other thing I'll say is that, you know, I do think part of it might be uh, the desire to seek status, even though they're going there for the entertainment and the novelty and the social aspect, it is easier to become um, or to achieve status there because it's not as saturated the way Instagram was, right? It, Instagram was founded before some of these kids were alive <laughs> and it's tailor-made for them. Whereas TikTok, I think um, it's a fresh place to start. So do you think that once a platform reaches, it turns into, you know, status media. Do you think that that's maybe when it has like plateaued? Yeah, well, it depends on how you think about it. From a venture perspective, it might not be where you want to plant your money at that point. But from a, a growth perspective, not necessarily, right? Um, if you look at, you know, Facebook or Instagram from, well, let's take Facebook just as a, a parent company their user numbers um, in developed countries have certainly started to slow, but internationally continue to grow. But while that's starting to stagnate, their revenue numbers keep increasing. And it's um, because they've kind of maybe switched into a different mode, it's not all about user growth, but it is about maximizing profit. And I mean, they're a public company and that's part of what they have to do. <laughs> um, I don't think it's you're necessarily saying, or I'm necessarily saying that by the time you hit status media, things are done. Because again, as I said, everyone continue, continues to seek status. What I am saying is that kind of the social aspect of it is maybe done. And so the, the fast pace of user growth has probably started to slow. So maybe you've reached a bit of maturity, not in terms of the dollar cent sign, but rather maybe in terms of the number of new users you're, you're acquiring. You also mentioned privacy and control as one of your five pillars. And as consumers are continuing to become more educated about privacy concerns, how do you think this impacts social media and the advertising uh, business model? Yeah, you know, it's, it's funny because I think consumers do care. And I think it's absolutely a concern that we should be taking seriously, but consumers haven't started to show that they care with their wallet that much yet. Um, I think it's one of the things it's easy to say, you know, I obviously don't want my information shared, but you know, I do want Instagram to serve me ads that are relevant to me, or I want Google to identify products that I might be interested in. I don't know that consumers always necessarily recognize how intertwined those are, and it hasn't you know, really affected advertising dollars yet. But I think that privacy control will continue to be important, whether it's on the advertising business model side or just kind of as something that's built into products. Like we look at TikTok in China and all of the concern there. And again, because you're working with a, a demographic that skews young, um, there's a lot of potential um, legal uh, concern to be aware of. And, you know, I think new players will really need to think about how they add in, whether it's additional privacy or just more user controls as the consumer gets smarter on that piece. And I think that's why, you know, we started to see a lot of these companies pop up that are either using avatars or using um, kind of a different type of um, identity within a social app. You know, Brad is an interesting example of using, you know, a fake personality to tell a story online. And um, it's allowing, if you extend that out to consumers and what a consumer might be able to do similar to that in the future, it's an avenue to kind of control your identity or control your story while still interacting with others online.
So, it, so it, are you thinking when it comes to, to like the future of social media? Are you thinking about data regulation at all because you still have this mismatch, or or not so much? I'm certainly thinking about it. Um, I don't have the answer yet in terms of um, how it's implemented or or what happens, but I think it is absolutely something that any company I'm talking to should be thinking about, um, both in terms of what they can be doing themselves as well as the types of data regulation that are going to be coming down the the pike soon. Got it. Yeah, yeah, I I agree. Um, so in terms of like the future social media platforms, I know you're you're quite bullish on it when many other venture capitalists um, aren't. Uh, so what what are you focused in terms of the next stage or type of platform that hasn't been covered? Yeah, I continue to think that there are big opportunities in social. And I think a couple areas where we're starting to see some early stage companies pop out are either around social uh, communities or social apps platforms for niche communities. We have one here at Canaan called Home Is, which is focused on uh, social communities for immigrants in major metros. So kind of taking um, slices of uh, communities that maybe already exist in real life or on WhatsApp groups or on Facebook and creating the tools and the platforms that are tailor-made for them and tailor-made for the types of interactions that they're looking to have. Uh, you know, I think gaming as kind of a new social network is a really interesting to think about. You look at Fortnite and the way that interact on Fortnite is really a social experience, right? Um, you're, you're on your Discord channel telling your friends, hey, let's play. A bunch of you are in a squad and then some of you are just watching. It's a totally different experience that you're, you know, filling your after school time with that maybe you used to be using AOL Messenger back in the day or, you know, you were on Facebook or then you were, you know, in spending it on Instagram. Now you're, you're playing your Switch or your Xbox. So I think that's another kind of opportunity thinking about how new paradigms of what is social can apply. And then I think there are other things like um, tools, you talked about some of those avatars um, that could exist across platforms, right? Like what is a tool that I might use over Instagram and TikTok and you know Snapchat or some sort of layer that maybe allows my identity to exist or my experience to, um, to kind of transcend across all platforms. Apart from these consumer trends, which I think are fascinating, what are some others that you're really excited about? Yeah, um, I, I've been spending a lot of time thinking about um, consumer healthcare, always looking at marketplace businesses, uh, new shopping and retail paradigms, climate change I've started to think about more, especially, um, you know, Gen Z is such a, a eco-conscious consumer. How do you think about sustainability or infrastructure for um, whether it's recycling or a circular economy models that are, you know, mixing hardware and software. Again, we're always looking to have some sort of technical scale or tech leverage to a business um, to get it to that huge outcome that is mass market that we talked about. Yeah, I, I think those are some of the areas that are keeping me busy. Um, but again, I think because consumers are fickle, I'm always open to serendipity of, you know, identifying something that just has that je ne sais quoi. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, I think that those are all really exciting trends. What is one thing that you would change when it came to venture capital? I would love to see the industry be more diverse and more democratized. I think it has made huge strides in recent years, but there's so, um, so much more to go. And I'm excited to see the industry start to change and have both VCs and founders who are more representative of the population as a whole. Absolutely. I, I completely agree with you. What's one book that inspired you personally and one book that inspired you professionally? My favorite book from a personal perspective is a book called The Sympathizer, um, which won the Pulitzer Prize and it chronicles the Vietnam War. Um, and it was really meaningful to me, my, my family for refugees from Vietnam. And reading that book really just allowed me to better understand the experiences of my parents and my brother and so many of my relatives in a very um, kind of visceral way. And so I, it was a book that was really meaningful to me and I, I read it on my first trip back to Vietnam. So that's one. And then on the uh, professional side, 
you know, it's a common, commonly cited book, but one that I have really um, pointed to is Grit. And I think Inventor, because it's such a long game and it's very luck driven, I think because Grit really reinforces the importance of effort, it helped keep me grounded in, in this career and is a great reminder to me of setting small goals, whether that's, you know, each day, how do I want to show up to meetings? What are three important interactions I want to have? What are three things I'm going to accomplish? And then also combine those with the bigger goals for my career. Um, it, it's a type of motivation or hi- helps highlight a type of motivation given how long this game is. I think those are two. Wow, that, that that's really interesting. I, I, I haven't read either of them. I'll, I'll certainly have to check out Sympathizer. That sounds really, really fascinating, as well as Grit. What's So what's your most recent investment and what makes you excited about it? My most recent investment is a company that's actually undisclosed. But what makes me excited about it is that it is a company that is breaking all of the rules of what it means to be a brand. Um, they barely have a website. They don't um, advertise their products. And they really change what the relationship between a brand and a consumer looks like and feels like. And um, it's just a really fun um, company that's kind of broken the paradigm of what it means to be a brand. Breaking all the rules of being in a brand. That sounds, um, I think that probably anyone is looking forward to, uh, 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 to seeing that. So my final question that I ask is, what's, what's one piece of advice that you have for founders of consumer companies? I would say to build a community and it doesn't have to be big but find a few other entrepreneurs some of whom are at your stage a few of whom are a little bit ahead of you um, and those who can be peers as well as mentors and help you navigate issues and provide resources and you know make the introductions to people you know so many of the things in starting a business are things that have been done before and there's no need to reinvent the wheel every time and you know, why not learn from the mistakes of others or why not leverage the networks of others? You know, all of these companies and all of these founders are, again, I keep saying this, but they're in the trenches and they're doing so many of the same things and having that community, I think can be such a game changer to early stage founders. You know, also the, uh, also on the, on the empathy side as well, just knowing what other people are going through and, and knowing that, that you have uh, a lot of commonality there uh, with the grit. Um, I think that's uh Uh, That's really just important just to kind of keep your spirits up. Laura, this has been absolutely phenomenal. Thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate chatting with you. Of course. It was such a pleasure. And thank you for having me. And there you have it. It was such a pleasure speaking with Laura about all things consumer. If you want to keep up to date with her, you can follow her on Twitter at Laura Chow. We will also have links to her piece, Finding Genius, in the show notes. If you're a founder and working on something innovative, have a question you'd like to hear VCs or founders answer on the show, you can DM me and follow me on Twitter at Mike Gelb. You can also follow for episode announcements at Consumer VC. For all episodes, please visit theconsumervc.com. Thanks again for listening.